Charles Dickens again. A favourite subject of mine, I've written as much about him as I have about Jack the Ripper. And Dickens, like you and me, was a true crime writer. Or, as a would-be cool in shades West Coast student screeched at me, all shook up in the 1960s, Oh my God, he's a murder freak! Dickens's nurse terrified him into nightmares when he was tiny, with tales of an imaginary Captain Murderer and his bloodthirsty deeds. The taste, once acquired, lasted. As a young reporter, he went to the trial of Bishop, Head and May, the Shoreditch body snatchers who murdered a Lincolnshire drover's boy and sold his body to the surgeons. Dickens was interested to notice that they didn't look remotely like stage villains, and you'd probably have employed them quite willingly if you hadn't known anything about them. But when he came to write novels, and include murders in Oliver Twist, Barnaby Rudge, Martin Chuzzlewit, Bleak House, A Tale of Two Cities, and Edwin Drood, he firmly put reality behind him and created luridly stagey murderers to satisfy his readers, just as he resolutely ignored the practical knowledge of prostitution and its perfectly ordinary human practitioners that he learned from working for charitable Miss Coote's Home for Fallen Women, and only created melodramatic creatures racked with guilt who long to throw themselves into the Thames whenever he came to write about that other great Victorian crime buff's obsession. But he kept up his practical observation of the murders that occurred around him. He visited prisons and saw condemned villains. He attended trials and watched Mrs. Manning's passionate tantrum in the dock and melodramatized it further into his own creation, Hortense, in Bleak House. And in America, he insisted on visiting the laboratory in Harvard, where Professor Webster dismembered the lanky body of his colleague, Professor Parkman, who would insist on repayment of the loan he'd made Webster. And in 1842, Dickens wrote from New York to his friend John Forster that his call for an international copyright had led to, and I quote, newspaper attacks making Colt, a murderer who's attracting great attention here, an angel by comparison. Well, now, that caught my notice pretty sharply. I'd never heard of Colt, a murderer attracting great attention in New York in 1842, and I thought I should have done so I did a little research. And here are the results. The Tombs Prison was built in 1838 on the damp, marshy land of an old swamp that had been drained and filled in. Officially, the confinement section of the New York Halls of Justice, the criminal courts being next door, it was quickly nicknamed the Tombs, because the architect had copied its design from an ancient Egyptian mausoleum. It was unhealthy and unpopular, and when Dickens became aware of John Colt undergoing its first bout of extraordinary unpopularity, on Colt's account, he was twenty-two, handsome, curly-haired, rich. His family were millionaires. His brother Samuel invented the Colt revolver and the Colt repeating rifle. His brother James devised a convenient design for the forty-five caliber handgun and sold it to the Texas Rangers and the New York police, who dubbed it the Peacemaker, long before its popularity among murderous gunslingers passing themselves off as heroic marshals in the Wild West, took the name out to Dodge City and Tombstone. The Colt family, gunsmiths and merchants, were millionaires. Young John was a playboy and dilettante man of letters, a friend of many leading American authors, Edgar Allan Poe, inventor of the detective story and the nevermore croaking raven, Dickens' friend and forerunner, Washington Irving, James Fenimore Cooper, whose excellent romantic imagination in titling The Last of the Mohicans, was only matched by his humorless tin ear in calling his heroic pioneer hero Natty Bumpo. Charles Dana, whose two years before the mast presaged a great journalistic career and who was introduced to Dickens as a most promising young man. And Dana knew John Colt and visited him in the tombs, where Colt was languishing for murder. He'd quarrelled with printer Samuel Adams, whom he wanted to produce a book for him, and with the nasty temper appropriate to a scion of the great gun-making family, he killed the poor man on the spot. 
It was an ordinary, dull, pointless killing at the height of a quarrel. The jury found him guilty with next to no deliberation. And if I hadn't another body in store for you, I shouldn't have troubled to tell you the story. This all occurred in 1841 and Colt was awaiting confirmation of sentence and execution the following year when Dickens came to town. The trouble was, not many people thought the righteous sentence of law would be carried out on him. His family was too rich, he was too well connected, and it looked as though the suspicious populace could be right when Dana visited his friend in prison. Now, it's one thing, and a perfectly proper thing, the prisoners on remand, held in custody while they await trial, but not yet found guilty of anything, should be allowed to buy in their own creature comforts if they can afford them. But a convicted bloody murderer awaiting execution, should such an unregenerate felon be living in the style Dana discovered? Consider this. As the keeper swings open the door of Colt's cell, the odour of sweet flowers strikes you. It is no delusion. For there they are, in a handsome vase upon the centre table. That handsomely dressed little lady with the golden hair and the sorrowful face whom we passed on the stairs has just left them. Tomorrow they'll be replaced by new ones. The table itself is a pretty one. There is nothing handsomer in Washington Square. In a gilt cage hanging against a wall is a canary. A pretty set of swinging shelves suspended by silken cords catches the eye. Here to be found the latest novel, the freshest magazine. You tread on roses, for the cold stones are concealed by rare Kidderminster. And Colt, how is it with him? In a patent extension chair he lolls, smoking an aromatic Havana. He has on an elegant dress gown, faced with cherry-coloured silk, and his feet are encased in delicately worked slippers. To one side of him is his bed, a miracle of comfort. Then comes his lunch, not cooked in the tombs, but brought in from a hotel. It consists of a variety of dishes, quail on toast, game patties, reed birds, fowl, vegetables, coffee, cognac. Then it's back again to his easy chair with book and cigar. Not surprisingly, a lot of honest citizens objected, and demanded that their municipal house of detention should not be a luxury rest home for millionaire murderers. Not surprisingly, many went further. They asked whether the Colt family money that had achieved so much for John already might not manage something a little bit extra and save him from the gallows. But this, it seemed, was not to be. All appeals failed. John's conviction was obstinately maintained, and his death date was set for the 18th of November, 1842. There was one important, unusual, and to many people scandalous concession to be made. On the very same day, the 18th of November, the authorities agreed, the sorrowful-faced, golden-haired little lady whom Dana had seen on the stairs could marry the young ne'er-do-well she had supplied so lovingly with flowers. Her name was Caroline Henshaw. The prison chaplain, the Reverend Mr. Anton, was to marry the doomed couple at midday, and Colt was to swing at 4 p.m. On the great day, a huge crowd was waiting outside the prison at dawn to catch a glimpse of Miss Henshaw, tragedy queen extraordinary. They missed the carriage that smuggled her up to a side door at half-past eleven, but they did hear the signal that the short ceremony had started. The carpenters, banging away at hammering together the scaffold on the yard, ceased their noisy labours out of respect as the couple were joined in ill-fated holy matrimony. And then the banging started again as soon as the Reverend Mr. Anton had pronounced the final blessing. There were groans from the crowd. Americans of the 1840s were thirsty for news, and in the absence of instant radio reporting, the guards at the prison doors kept the crowd informed of what was going on. They're married. The guests have gone. They've hung a silk curtain over the cell door. They wanted champagne. The carpenters are testing the gallows. At each announcement, the crowd groaned again. The American gallows of 1842 needed a different kind of testing from our own, by the way. Whereas we used a drop in the scaffold to let the prisoner fall to his fast neck-snapping or slow strangulation, Yankee ingenuity had devised something a little more mechanically complicated. The rope passed up from the noose to the beam, 
where it went round a pulley, and the loose end held a large weight substantially heavier than the prisoner. This was supported at the top of the gallows until his doom was pronounced, at which point it was released and fell to the ground, dragging him quickly up into the air to stop with a jerk as the weight reached the floor. Dickens thought the whole procedure was much more dignified than the British parallel, which seemed strange at first glance, whisking skyward like a jack-in-the-box, looking rather bizarre compared with falling directly out of sight beneath the scaffold flooring. But what really impressed Dickens was the privacy of the whole business. Inside prison walls. Our public executions were still brutalising uproarious feast days for ghouls and pickpockets. Anyway, at half-past one, Miss Henshaw, now Mrs. Colt, left the prison, smiling bravely for the benefit of the crowd. Colt now had two hours in which to sit in his patent chair, smoke his aromatic Havana, and prepare to meet his maker. At half-past three, Mr. Anton came in to offer him the last consolations of religion. Hardly had the good parson entered the luxurious condemned cell than cries of fire broke out and smoke started to fill the prison. A wooden cupola on top of the criminal courts next door was ablaze. Panic ensued. Many of the guards abandoned their posts and rushed out into the streets for safety. Convicts started banging on their doors and beseeching the turnkeys to let them out before they burned to death. Ironically, Dickens had depicted just such a panic the previous year in Barnaby Rudge when he described rioters setting fire to Old Newgate Prison and the men in the condemned cells awaiting execution the following day pleading to be released from the traps where they were about to be incinerated immediately. The few remaining tombs guards opened some doors and frightened prisoners tumbled out into the landings and corridors. And as the panic was at its height, the chaplain came rushing up to the sheriff, screaming, Mr. Colt is dead! He has a dagger in his heart! Sheriff Monmouth Hart did not question this awful news or proceed to check up himself. He raced away in search of a doctor to verify the death, and no one went back to the cell until the doctor had been found. Mr. Anton went about his business somewhere else. The doctor pronounced that the body lying on the bed with a large dagger protruding from its chest was indeed past recovery. The hanging was now unnecessary. The sheriff summoned the commoner and assembled a jury for an immediate inquest in the prison, and with no one giving evidence except the sheriff and the doctor, a verdict of suicide was returned at 7 p.m. that night, and the body was instantly handed over to the Colt family and buried in St. Mark's churchyard before daybreak. And where was Mrs. John Colt, nay, Caroline Henshaw? No one ever saw her again. Which seemed to answer the first question the prince wanted answered. Where had Colt acquired the dagger to kill himself? It seemed certain that his missus had smuggled it into the cell when she came to marry him, and so used the wedding ceremonial to help him cheat the gallows. There was great indignation, and a demand that Mrs. Colt should be found, interrogated, and brought to justice. But, as Uncle Tom Cobb and all puts it, that ain't the end of this shocking affair. An inquiry into the fire at the tombs revealed that a number of prisoners had escaped while half the guards were saving their own skins in the street and the other half were humanely saving convicted felons from roasting alive. And somebody then asked some pertinent questions about the fate of John Colt. His inquest and burial had been surprisingly rushed, hadn't they? Nobody who knew him had identified the body on the bed as being cold, at least not so far as the jury knew. They'd simply taken the word of Sheriff Hart and the doctor that this was the body found in Colt's cell. Not even Mr. Anton had been called before them, and he was presumably the last person to see Colt alive, presumably a man whose cloth meant that he would not have been able to lie under oath. Had the Colt family money been used effectively again? Had they conspired to start the fire at the most effective moment, ensuring that its actual presence in the courthouse meant no danger to the prisoners in the tombs, though the prevailing wind would make it seem the jail was about to become an inferno? Had the conspirators actually murdered someone of roughly Colt's size, age and appearance, leaving the body to be found while Colt, like other prisoners, got away in the confusion? Where was Mrs. Caroline Colt? The press expected that the Governor of New York would order a full inquiry. But he didn't. 
Now there, I have little doubt, we see the imprints of cult family money and influence. A newly appointed chief of police, George Walling, made it clear that he thought it very likely a corpse had been substituted. But he was never given the go-ahead to investigate further. And there again, I think, the hand of the Colt family may be seen. But in 1850 came what seemed evidence that Colt was alive, kicking, and still entertaining literary aspirations. Through the mails from Texas, Edgar Allan Poe received an unsigned manuscript. He stared, for the handwriting, it seemed to him, was unmistakably that of his late lamented friend, John Colt. Poe took the mysterious manuscript to Lewis Clark, editor of the Knickerbocker magazine, and another former friend of Colt's. He found Clark already scratching his head over an identical manuscript, equally evidently in Colt's hand. It seemed to the two men of letters that Colt was trying to let them know in the discreetest possible way that he was alive and well and still hoped for a literary career. In 1852, an eyewitness declared that this was indeed the case. Samuel Everett, a close friend of Colt's, took a holiday on the West Coast, and on his return to New York he told everyone that he'd actually met Colt, coming across him quite accidentally when out riding in the Santa Clara Valley. Colt had taken him home to the magnificent hacienda where he lived in his accustomed luxury with his wife, the missing former Caroline Henshaw. Of course, as a friend of the Colts, Everett declined to let the authorities know just how to track down Mr. and Mrs. Colt and start interstate extradition proceedings. Was his story true? Many people doubted it. Many others thought the chain of opportune coincidence was just too great to be accidental, the extraordinary permission to marry, the fire at the appropriate time when attention was distracted, the rushed inquest and immediate burial, and above all, the totally unexplained disappearance of the young widow Colt. 150 years before O.J. Simpson provoked the query, can the law be imposed upon the rich? America was already deeply concerned that money had talked, and it seemed a killer had walked. Yeah.